welcome back. Glad to have you here. Um, Corey again, talking to you uh, this week, responding to uh, a couple of things. One, I wanted to say a big thank you to everybody. Uh, one for birthday wishes uh, last week after um, my video from last week. I appreciate all those birthday wishes. Those were really, really sweet. Also, thank you for all the congratulations um, on the one year anniversary of the book, which was kind of the, the, the main thing I was talking about in my last video. So um, huge thanks for all of that. Um, so this time around, I'm actually responding to a uh, conversation that was happening on a podcast that I listened to, which is called Southern Bramble, um, that features uh, Austin Banix Bramble on Instagram, uh, which is Southern Light Marshall. Uh, and then uh, Thorn Mooney was their guest, um, who you may know from uh, The Witch's Path and several other books as well. Um, and they were all kind of having a very interesting, wide ranging discussion. They covered a lot of really cool topics. But one of the topics that came up was the idea of what's a daily practice, like what goes into what we consider kind of the idea of a, a regular practice when it comes to um, witchcraft or folk magic. Um, and Marshall kind of gave some really nice uh, summaries of some practices that, uh, that they've developed um, as a part of, you know, learning and growing uh, in their sort of religious witchcraft framework. Um, uh, and then, you know, Thorne was talking about some of the things from her book that um, help to let people find their own practices as well um, and, and, and sort of own those practices as things that they can actually do on a daily basis. Um, but I thought it'd be really fun, interesting, worth uh, diving into a little bit, talk about uh, what does a daily practice look like uh, for somebody who's practicing kind of folk magic or um, who's uh, maybe identifies in sort of a folk witchcraft general category, right? Um, because for some folks who are practicing folk magic, that is not necessarily about, um, you know, following some of the same sort of religious structures that um, other people are following when they're doing religious witchcraft. Um, but there is still some structure to it. And there is still oftentimes sort of a spiritual worldview that goes along with that. So I wanted to take just a few minutes today to talk about one, you know, what does this look like in terms of actual folklore? Um, if we look to things like folk tales, fairy tales, um, recorded accounts of folk magic, witchcraft, things like that. What are people doing on a regular basis? And then also kind of, uh, I thought I'd share some of my own practices, talk about, you know, what is it that I do um, on, uh, you know, as a regular practitioner uh, of folk magic, as somebody who's kind of built my own practice over a very long period of time. Um, and what does that look like for me? In terms of what we see historically or through transmitted legends and uh, folk tales, fairy tales, things like that, there's a vast variety. Like there's no one specific way that people practice um, their their magic, their, their folk witchcraft um, in these stories. It just sort of depends on the story that you're telling and the story that you're hearing. Um, so for example, there's a great collection of uh, stories from mostly Appalachia, although it does uh, go a little outside of that region too. Uh, it's called uh, The Silver Bullet by Hubert Davies. And, uh, and in that book, he's telling stories about, you know, what does it mean to be a witch? What, how does one become a witch? What do witches actually do? Some of the practices that sort of come up uh, for example, there's one story about a couple of hunters who are out uh, in the woods and they see a local witch, or at least somebody who is suspected to be a local witch, um, out dancing in a circle that she creates um, in the middle of some trees. And they say they observe her doing this over the course of 13 nights. And then on the 13th night, she um, sacrifices a chicken and throws it into the woods. And then um, in that story, the devil appears or, how, you know, if you want to read it as sort of like uh, a dark forced spirit appears, uh, however you want to sort of contextualize that. Um, they definitely perceive it as the devil in that story. And that's sort of an initiatory practice. Um, uh, if you're looking at that, there's definitely a sort of an initiatory bent to that. But there's also a sense that this dancing in a circle in the woods um, is a thing that a witch does, right? It's a, it's, a, it's a practice that she has, and she's doing it at least regularly over the course of those two weeks or so. So there's a lot of stories like that. Um, there's a lot of stories about going to witch meetings on a regular basis. Uh, sometimes these are things that happen once a year. Sometimes these are things that happen closer to once a month. Sometimes these are things that happen two or three times a year. Um, and these witch meetings are oftentimes chances for witches to, um, in, in the story in The Silver Bullet, um, uh, they're talking about what are called witch bullets or witch balls. Um, and the idea is that every witch gathers a specific ingredient. This might be a specific type of thorn um, or it might be um, bones of a specific animal. It might be some hair or something like that. And they all bring it 
um, and whatever they're supposed to bring, they all collect together and they create these little, basically like wax and hair bullets that they can then use to cast curses or spells. Um, and they're supposed to, you know, retrieve these if they use them and things like that too. But the creation of those witch bullets um, is a part of that practice, right? It's the thing that they're doing as as part of their regular practice, um, even though the regularity of that practice may be um, something that happens uh, less frequently than obviously daily or weekly or something like that. It's only happening a few times a year, um, but it is part of their regular practice. Um, in terms of uh, other activities that we see magical folk doing in stories, um, if we turn to fairy tales, for example, a lot of times domestic activities get tied up or tied together with um, folk magic and witchcraft. So um, if you've ever uh, heard a story of Vasilisa the Beautiful and Baba Yaga, uh, or, or Frau Hola as well, if you listen to the story of Frau Hola um, uh, from the Grimm's Collection, you know that one of the things that um, the young women who wind up in the employ of these kind of witch figures like Frau Hola or Baba Yaga, they're, re they're required to clean. They're supposed to clean um, or, or cook dinner or cook food. Um, they're supposed to uh, perform basically like household chores as a component of their, their practice. And oftentimes they'll do so in a way that is um, at least somewhat magical, either uh, in Vasilisa's case, she's got a doll uh, that's basically imbued with the spirit of her mother that will help her with all of her tasks. Um, or in some fairy tales, uh, for example, the the Queen Bee, which is the this, this story that I just did on our most recent Witch's Almanac episode, um, a, a young man basically winds up befriending a bunch of animals and the animals go out and do his, um, his chores for him, the tasks that he's required to do to sort of um, win, uh, win the sort of prize that he's after. Um, and in uh, Frau Hola, she's not necessarily... Um, doing magic specifically while she's sort of sweeping the house, but there are magical things that happen. So for example, um, when she helps shake out the down comforter for Frau Hola, um, it creates snow in the world because Frau Hola is associated um, with the sort of uh, goddess of winter. Uh, and so she becomes this, this winter figure who's she, she's spreading uh, snow on the ground when she shakes out her, her blankets or when the young woman leaves, um, all of the dirt that she swept up suddenly gets transformed into gold that she can then take home with her. Um, even before she gets to the house um, of Frau Hola, she has to do things like taking food, bread out of an oven um, because it's, it's actually crying out to her. So she's responding to that sort of animated, inanimate object, right? This bread that's alive that she has to take care of. Uh, and even when she enters into the world, she's doing drop spindle um, spinning so she's spinning some thread using a drop spindle and um that falls into a well and she has to trace after chase after it to, to enter that world so there's a lot of that um there's a story of for example the 12 horned women which is found in um irish folklore collections uh, and there's some variations on it that we see in other places as well where the the women that come in are doing things like carding wool um spinning thread, weaving it into garments and things like that. So there's a lot of domestic work and domestic chores that become a part of that daily practice. So if you are somebody who does these kind of domestic um, activities, uh, whether that's doing laundry, whether that is sweeping the floor, whether that is uh, you know, sewing or spinning or darning or whatever you do. I darn my own socks quite a lot, actually. <laughs> um, and oftentimes I will actually work in little bits of magic into that. So um, when I repaired a coat a couple of years ago, I took a piece of the thread that I was going to use and I uh, dressed it with some salt water as a sort of protective aid and then sort of wove that into the coat. So it sort of becomes a, a protective barrier that I'm wearing when I, when I wear this repaired coat. Um, there's also a lot of stories, for example, if you've ever heard the story of the hag or a variation of these kinds of stories where the, the person, the, the witch in question, will actually slip out of their skin um, at night and go flying around. So flying, which flight is a big part of regular practice. So spending some time in those, those spaces where you're flying out into the, the wider world or doing uh, doing sort of uh, trance work, for lack of a better term. Um, I hate to equate those things too tightly because I think there's some, some definite separation in some of that, but it's also not entirely dissimilar either. So if you're spending time in these kind of altered states of consciousness, specifically because those are part of your magical practice, that's something that we see in some of the folklore as well. Also, a lot of folk practitioners will be doing things like um, offering specific prayers to specific saints or specific figures that they work with. Um, so for example, it's an expedite or expedite, however you want to pronounce that. You're 
obligations to him are usually to either praise him uh, publicly. So you may be doing some internet posting, uh, praising him, for, for example. Uh, it used to be that you would post a little uh, ad in the back of your classified section of your newspaper, but now you can do it online or offering him a little bit of pound cake, uh, Sara Lee pound cake particularly. Um, I work with St. Anthony uh, quite a bit. Uh, so one of the things that I have to do is make sure that I'm making offerings on his behalf, uh, particularly to things like food pantries or food banks. Um, and I don't necessarily do that you know, every day or every week, um, but I do try to consciously do that uh, certain times uh, throughout the year, um, sort of in his name or on his behalf as a way to sort of fulfill those obligations as well. Uh, and we see that uh, among a number of folk practitioners, they'll have obligations to particular spirits or entities that they're working with and fulfilling those becomes a part of their practice. So, so that's, if we're turning to folklore, that's a lot of what we're seeing are these kinds of daily practices that are very either woven into the things you're already doing, the household chores that you're doing, or that um, become these very particular kind of occasional activities uh, where you've sort of heightened or elevated what you're doing. And then occasionally you'll have something where uh, you're doing something that's very witchcraft focused. So for example, slipping out of your skin and flying at night or doing any kind of witch flight. So it can vary a lot. There's no one right way to do a daily practice. Um, it's all going to depend on kind of your circumstances and what you do, what your comfort levels are in terms of that practice. In terms of me, I do um, my own set of practices that are um, comfortable for me and things that I like to do, things that I've, I've developed over a fairly long period of time. And some of them are daily practices. Some of them are weekly practices. Some of them are monthly practices. Some of them are, uh, you know, more occasional than that. Um, so I, thought I just kind of go through a few of the things that make up my regular practice. Uh, one of the things that I do uh, every morning uh, when I'm taking a shower, I'll actually do a brief version of the lesser banishing ritual of the pentagram or the LBRP. Um, and I've, I've posted before about the idea of not, that I don't cast circles particularly um, to do magic. And I've had people kind of push back and say like, well, if you're doing the LBRP, you're casting a circle. And I, I, I can see the logic on that. I, don't, I tend not to think of it that way because I'm not using it to contain anything. I'm not really using it purely as a sort of protective barrier while working magic. It's a, just a general kind of protective charm that I do at the beginning of the day. But it's, it's what's worked for me for the past over half a decade. And I really um, developed it um, when I did some outer court training with a a Wiccan group well over a decade ago. They That was part of their practice. And I got really used to it. The format of it is very, very easy to follow. And so I've, I've used it off and on since then. And then about uh, five or six years ago, I started doing it daily. And it's very effective. Uh, so I do that kind of every day in the shower that takes, you know, a couple minutes, uh, just, you know, uh, two minutes. And, and I've got the basics of this, this practice done. Um, and it's super simple. Um, uh, I know some people get much more involved with how they do their LBRP. Some people bring in specific tools. For me, it's not that. It's just a matter of doing a few ritual gestures, uh, making some ritual intonations, and um, then sort of feeling like I've got at least a baseline, a uh, very simple level of warding or protection that I can use. If I encounter anything throughout the day, it sort of puts me on alert for that. Um, some other things that I do, um, and speaking of being on alert for for what's around me. Paying attention to signs and omens is huge. That's a big part of my daily practice. Um, that's something that I see repeated a lot in the folklore. So people would be paying attention to, you know, did you drop a dish or did you drop a spoon? Did you drop a fork? Um, what does that mean? What does it mean if you're, if a dish rag falls? What does it mean if a bird is trying to get into your house? Something that's come up recently on our Discord server, somebody was talking about a bird that was repeatedly trying to get into the house and how do you interpret that? Uh, and, you know, there's definitely the sort of rational scientific way of interpreting it. Uh, oftentimes when I'm talking about signs and omens, I'm less concerned about the signs and omens existing in the world. Uh, so you know, the bird trying to get into your house, the bird has its own objectives. Whatever it's doing, it's trying to get into your house for its own reasons. But the fact that you're noticing it, the fact that your attention is on it is what makes it a sign or an omen, right? So your um, elevated attention is, is what gives it value. Uh, at least that's how I always kind of work with it. So the fact that I'm noticing something, Okay, well, that's what's kind of catching my my eye. That's what's kind of making me want to pay attention to it. Some of the biggest things for me, and this is ridiculous and silly, but I pay a lot of attention to clocks. I'm watching throughout the day. I'll see if, for example, it turns 11-11. Uh, if I happen to see the time, then I immediately pause and say a little uh, wish prayer, a little uh, thing just to sort of help boost my um, my luck or my fortune uh, at that moment. Um, so it's a, a particular time of day. Any of those kind of repeated numbers, it, it's a big thing. So, uh, you know, one eleven. 222, 333, uh, any of those, if I catch those, I will say this little momentary prayer um, because I'm looking for those kinds of uh, moments of magic, right? Um, similarly, if I see different kinds of, you know, birds, you know, birds that are out there in the wild, right? So if I see uh, crows flying from one direction, I'll sort of pay attention to that and think, okay, that means this one thing could happen. 
Um, if I see them fly, flying from the left-hand side, I'll sort of count them and say, well, okay, how many crows are flying from the left versus from the right? And that can sort of give me a sense of where my luck is for that moment. I mean, it doesn't mean that it's hard and fast and, you know, absolutely unmovable, but it does give me a, at least a sort of baseline reading on where I am right then and what I might need to do to sort of correct for, for any um, circumstances that are not, you know, working in my favor, right? So paying attention to signs and omens is a really big one for me. Um, part of what I do to make sure that things are going in my favor, another kind of daily practice is oftentimes I'll pick um, a pocket charm. I'll pick, I'll pick something that I'm going to carry with me for the day. I mean, I've got a whole little uh, little dish of pocket charms that I, I keep handy and they, they're they all over the place, right? So I've got some, some of them are actually pocket charms I carry on behalf of other people if I'm working a particular uh, spell that day. Uh, some of them are, for example, one of my favorites is my Lucky Rabbit's Foot, um, which I went through a very specific ritual to kind of make that. Uh, and I really, really love that charm. Um, it's one that I use for very, very important things. For things when I want to have just sort of a general witchcraft protection thing, this is a little pocket doll that someone made me once that I just absolutely love. And I carry her just as a sort of like companion. I have another type of luck charm that somebody made me uh, a couple of years ago that I like to carry with me sometimes. Um, every once in a while, I'll actually carry, I'll wear uh, what's called a scapular, which is a small, it's a Catholic thing where you actually wear this over your shoulders under your clothes and you wear this around and it keeps particular saints or particular in influences kind of close to you um, and surrounding. So that's another thing I do. So these little pocket charms, these little wearable charms, um, I've oftentimes got little charms on me all the time. Um, so those sorts of things are part of my daily practice as well, um, just depending on the kind of influence that I want to have. Now, do I make one of those every day? No, absolutely not. That's Those are involved processes. Those take um, minutes, if not hours to make them. Uh, but I may grab one to tuck it in my pocket. Um, I may feed it with a little bit of oil uh, or in a lot of cases, something simple like coffee or a little drop of whiskey from a whiskey bottle. Um, sometimes it'll be a little bit of olive oil or even just a breath uh, and a quick recitation of a portion of a prayer or something like that. Just to sort of activate it and make it sort of charged up for that day's work. That's the kind of stuff that I'm doing. And then I tuck it in my pocket and I carry it with me. And that's part of my practice. Um, so that's another kind of daily thing that I do. Uh, and then one other thing that I do daily is at the end of the day, I will, as I'm heading to bed, brush my teeth, get ready for bed, everything like that. And then I'll go to kind of where the center of my house is and I'll pause and I'll put my hands on the walls and I'll thank the house for everything it's done that day. All of the good things it's done, all of the benefits it's offered to, to myself, to my family, um, the protection it's provided, the safety, the refuge, the home that it is. I'm thankful to it. And I'll tell it that uh, just so that it knows, so that my home knows you know, what, how I feel, how I feel about um, all that it does. So um, that's sort of my daily practice uh, in terms of, you know, what am I doing regularly? Uh, you'll notice, you know, in all of that, there's not a lot of um, spending time with particular spirits um, because uh, for some people they do make daily offerings to their spirits and that's fine. Again, everybody kind of works differently. For me, the spiritual work is oftentimes working on a more weekly or even monthly schedule. So my weekly schedule, you can see kind of over my shoulder here, I have a little altar space back there um, where I work with my ancestors. Um, and if these are ancestors, both of my family line, my, my sort of flesh and blood ancestors, as well as ancestors from my sort of spiritual teacher line as well. So so I'll, I'll offer some, just a few candles, some incense, some water. Um, there's a bell back there that I ring for them as well. Um, some prayers, just spending a little time with them. Um, uh, those ancestors and the spirits that I work with most often, I'll spend that time with them kind of on a weekly basis. And then, you know, I'm also doing little re-ups for spells that are sort of under operation. So if I have something that, you know, I did, you know, a novena for, but now it's kind of in uh, sort of maintenance mode, then, you know, once a week, I'll make sure that, you know, if it needs to be dressed with oil, it gets a little bit of oil. Um, if it gets, um, you know, a quick prayer or a quick recitation with my hand kind of uh, over the top of it, I'll do that. Um, those kinds of things happen kind of on a weekly basis. I'm also spending time on a weekly basis, kind of paying attention to kind of the world outside around me. So beyond the signs and omens, I like to make sure I'm paying attention to and tapped into sort of the current of the natural world. So uh, one of the things I like to do is, you know, I walk my dog every day. Um, and so I pay attention to kind of things on that walk, but at least once or twice a week, I'm also paying attention to things like what's actually growing right now um, in my area. So um, right now we have mulberries that are all uh, bursting forth and June berries that are all bursting forth. So I'm very aware of those. And I'll have a few of them. I'll, I'll eat a few of them. I'll thank the trees for those. Um, the ducks are all having ducklings and things like that. So I'm very aware of what's going on 
uh, kind of in my little space, my little area around. Um, I'm also paying attention to like, so for example, when the chicory uh, is starting to grow by the roadside, I'll, I'll be aware of like chicory root growing, uh, or I'll see when the, the mugwort has really started to, to burst, um, which is happening quite a lot now, actually. Um, I'll notice when neighbors' mint plants are growing or when their, uh, their bleeding heart plants have lost all of their blossoms and things like that. And none of that is necessarily because I'm going to go out and use those things immediately, but just so that I'm aware of kind of where they are and what's available to me. So, um, you know, as the late summer approaches and early fall hits, aware that the milkweed pots are going to burst and we've got uh, what I call wishing seeds. I've got all the little milkweed seeds that I can use to make specific wishes and wish charms, right? Uh, whereas right now, uh, I might not have as much access to something like that. I might have to use some that are from last year, uh, that are bottled up from last year. Um, so that's something else I'm doing. I'm also paying attention to lunar signs and shifts and things like that. Um, you know, I do our, our almanac episodes once a month and sort of chart out when we're going to have shifts from different signs and uh, when we're going to be moving through sort of the lunar phases of the month. And so I'm paying attention to that, but I'm oftentimes just kind of looking at, you know, is the moon waxing, is the moon waning? Um, I'm looking at kind of the stars that I can visibly see in the night sky. Uh, and paying attention to that as well. Um, and again, not necessarily because I'm thinking, oh, I have to be able to do this spell and the moon is in this particular phase or this particular sign, but just so that I can be aware of it, um, so that I can be paying attention to it. If that, if the need should arise, I know where I am, right? I know what the circumstances are uh, and I can kind of adjust to that uh, as a folk practitioner. Uh, and then monthly, you know, I do pay attention to the moon phases um, sort of in a, in a weekly cycle, but I'm also really looking for those, you know, full and new moons as well. Those are oftentimes what I'm doing uh, with the full moons. I'm doing kind of honor work for the moon um, because I, I, the moon is very important to me as part of my life and my practice. And so, for example, I oftentimes will read poems uh, for um, the full moons uh, so in, uh, and they're not necessarily witchy poems. Um, you know, oftentimes they come from, you know, one of these two collections, uh, John Clare's Shepherd's Calendar uh, or uh, March Piercy's The Moon is Always Female um, because she has a cycle of poems that are specifically about the Hebrew calendar and the moons, the full moons there in the, in the uh, Hebrew calendar. John Clare's is more monthly. It's more sort of the typical Gregorian calendar um, monthly cycle, but his poems are a little longer and really get into kind of the seasonal rural cycles of England. It's a little different than what I experienced, but it, this, it at least kind of puts me in that mindset uh, a little bit. So, you know, that's what I'm doing for full moons. And then for new moons, oftentimes I'm just uh, have a few specific spirits that I'll light a candle to or I'll talk to. Uh, and I'll do some divination and things like that too. So that's kind of how I uh, do monthly work. And then I regularly, I do have other stuff that I do. I have particular spirits that I honor on particular days, of uh, saints days and feast days and things like that. Um, and not necessarily just saints. Um, I have some that I work with that are not, definitely not saints. <laughs> those uh, those uh, get um, particular candles or particular prayers or recitations on particular days as well. Um, there's a lot of seasonal folklore tied into holidays that I work with as well. Um, and all of that uh, becomes a part of my practice. You can see a lot of that's, it's not elaborate. Um, none of it is, is, you know, sitting here doing, uh, you know, half an hour's worth of meditation every day. None of it is sitting there, you know, crafting an elaborate ritual or do casting a spell a day. I, you know, I think that the spell a day calendars or the spell a day books and things like that, those can be really wonderful for inspiration, but I don't have time. I just never have time for that. Like what I have time to do the LBRP is two minutes in the morning, grabbing a pocket charm and getting it charged up takes less than 60 seconds. Watching for omens and signs just kind of happens throughout the day, probably takes all of five to 10 minutes of my attention throughout the day. Uh, and my good night gratitude prayers under two minutes, right? That is, you know, less than 15 to 20 minutes of my day. And boom, that's, that's an entire daily practice there. And it's spread out over the day. Um, it's just kind of uh, integrated. Uh, my weekly stuff um, takes maybe an hour for the really dedicated stuff that I do every week. And then it's a little bit spread out here and there too. So a couple of 15 minute dog walks, right? Um, paying attention to the, the moon overhead that overlaps with paying attention to the plants that are growing around sometimes. The monthly offerings when I do my moon poetry stuff, um, which I know sounds very hippy dippy, but that's it's what I do. Um, when I do those, those poetry uh, readings, um, those are, you know, maybe, maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes that I'm doing and spending some time moon gazing uh, during that. So all in all, maybe half an hour for that. Divinations take half an hour or less most of the time if I'm doing just kind of a basic divination. Um, and then the kind of more irregular stuff, those do wind up being elevated a little more because those are the times that I can actually pull out of my calendar to do more dedicated stuff. Um, and that's fine. That's, that's kind of how I work. That's not necessarily how you're going to work. It's not necessarily how anybody else is going to work. And that's okay too. Um, you have your own practice and you make 
take the time that you can make as a folk practitioner, if that's what you identify as, if that's what you're working within is that tradition, it's going to depend on kind of what you're doing. For some of you, the cooking that you do is where you weave your magic in, right? Um, and so part of your cooking process may just be, you know, saying something over a pot that you're stirring, right? And that's, you know, all 30 seconds of your day, but it's a part of your practice, right? Those are the kind of things that are, that become a daily practice. It's not necessarily about setting aside this elaborate ritual time. Um, doing the LBRP is probably the most elaborate thing I do in terms of my daily rituals. And, you know, I can do that two minutes in the shower, right? And that's, and that's pretty far, far out there uh, for a lot of, a lot of people. Uh, you really don't have to go that far with it either. Um, so whatever you're doing, even if it's all you're doing is, you know, saying a quick prayer of protection for yourself before you leave the door or making sure that you've thrown a bay leaf in your shoe for a little bit of extra luck, whatever it is, those little acts, those little bits of magic are enough. They're, they're plenty. Uh, what you're doing, um, as long as you are adding magic to the world uh, through your actions, that's enough. You've, you've done what you need to do. That's, that is how you build the practice, right? Is, is that, that work, that daily small amount of dedication is more than enough. So all that being said, I'm also very curious what other people do, because I, you know, I'm saying this based on the things that I read, the things that people have shared with me, but everybody's different. And I, I know there are people out there with more interesting practices than I have, or that have uh, you know, vastly different practices, or that maybe have integrated things in different ways. I'd love to hear more about your practices. Please, please, please feel free to um, uh, drop comments uh, on the video uh, and let me know what it is that you're doing. Uh, what are some of the practices that you uh, make part of your daily practice? I mean, if you don't feel comfortable doing that and you want to send them privately, you can do that um, through our email address, which is compassandkey at gmail.com. Um, love to hear from people all the time about this. So um, that's going to kind of do it for me for today. Uh, if you have thoughts, again, comment, send emails. Um, please do, if you enjoy these kind of conversations, like subscribe just so that we you know, know, know what people are interested in. Um, share this around if you, if you, if you like it. Uh, feel free to react to it yourself and share your own videos too. Uh, I'd love to uh, have conversations like this that are ongoing. So uh, until next time, thanks for watching. Be well. Mm -hmm.